All right, students, welcome back. Um, so as I said uh, during the last lecture, um, this lecture I'm going to cover uh, trying to um, determine what the malware did on the system. If um, typically, you know, is the case, uh, you end up only having a small piece of information uh, that tells you um, that something is that something's wrong that uh, that needs to be investigated. Um, a lot of times, you might have just like this little piece of information when you're doing malware analysis as well. Um, so you're trying to simulate uh, what the investigative steps would be uh, on a normal system in order to try and uh, figure out, um, you know, what uh, what's happening. And so in our case, um, what I said we would do is <clears throat> we would try and um, identify, um, say what's happening based upon knowing that this IP address is bad. So if you remember, I used my Kali machine um, as the uh, what's called the command and control server, um, basically the operator that an adversary would use. So I was simulating the adversary um, to get the Windows machine, which was a legitimate computer, um, to connect back and give me control. Uh, so in order to do that, it needs to, uh, the Windows VM needs to open a connection to my Kali VM, uh, which means that um, I have some information <clears throat> to look for to start my investigation. So, you know, here's the analysis exercise page. Um, I updated this a little bit uh, from the last time you saw it, um, and we'll go into that later on when I get to that piece. Um, but right now, uh, what we'll do is we'll investigate the network connection um, data. So one of the um, programs that I had you run um, is this NetStat program, which goes and pulls um, the activity, uh, the network activity from the system. And in this case, um, this command dumps it into a text file. So we looked over that text file during the last class. And what I'll do is I will um, bring it up here uh, for you all to see. You can also load it up in BIM or just, uh, you know, cat it out in a terminal or something like that. But um, <clears throat> what we would want to do, and actually it'll probably be a little bit easier for us to um, bring this up in a terminal. So that's what I'm going to do. So I will bring uh, this file up in a terminal. So I'll have it right here. And what I will do is I'll make this bigger. There we go. So make this bigger for uh, for you all to see. Uh, so what I'm going to do in a nutshell is I'm going to look for the IP address that I know to be bad. So um, we're going to try and walk from this to figure out what happened on the system. Um, <clears throat> you know, in order to keep the malware present. So basically, we'd like to derive some of those configuration choices that you made when you built this backdoor, just using information that we've collected from the system. So in this case, um, this is the NetStat output. Um, it uh, lists all of the network connections um, that are open or listening. Um, so you may have a connection established, um, which means that um, you know this system plus another system are communicating to one another. Uh, so typically, the initiator, the conversation will be on this side, the, uh, um, you know, the, the left hand side, and then the destination will be on the right hand side. So in this case, the Windows machine, uh, connected out to this Kali, uh, VM in order to set up that command and control channel. Um, you also have a large number of listening, um, ports as well. So these are right here. And what these tell you is, um, they listen on this port. Um, and they allow any traffic in. So anytime it's listening, the left-hand side is um, what IP address on the local machine um, plus what port it's open is available for incoming connections. And then the right-hand side is the filter that um, lists what's allowed to connect in. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go down here to the, um, you know, to the, to look at the connections that are open. And you can see there's two connections opened. Um, so in my case, uh, when I ran the system compromise, 
uh, I ended up having a session open um, that was the original session, um, and then another session that was the um, escalated, um, you know, the uh, the one that uh, escalated when I did a Git system, so the one that gave me system privileges. These are both connected to a program named invoice.exe. So you can see here, um, for every single one of the um, network sockets that are listed here, there's a program name underneath them that tells you which program uh, was responsible for those connections. So what I might do here next is I might take this invoice.exe, and what I'll do is I will actually open up another, um, I'll open up a notes.txt, right? Um, so I might put known bad 192.168.56.104. <clears throat> so I'll put that there as like what I knew going into the investigation. And then I'll put what I learned. So invoice.exe is something that's known to be associated with that. So what I might do is I might look for invoice.exe here. And so I see that in this particular uh, document, in this particular output, it only shows up in two locations, um, which is uh, one for each one of those sockets that are opened. Um, however, now I've learned something that is a, uh, a file style object, right? So there's invoice.exe that likely indicates to me, you know, my intuition tells me that um, this system probably has a file on it somewhere that's named invoice.exe. So I'm going to close this right now. And I'm going to um, <clears throat> look through the other data that we collected. So if you remember, uh, we pulled a memory dump. Uh, we pulled the uh, master file table, which is the entire directory listing of the, um, of the whole system, um, the auto runs configuration, and then the, um, the registry, so the system configuration of Windows. So the next thing I might want to do is I might want to go and look in the file system directory because that's probably location where some invoice.exe file might be located. So um, if I go through here, now this is, um, I've loaded up the MFT CSV, so the output from that uh, MFT to CSV file. Um, that has been plugged into, um, into this uh, spreadsheet. So you can see it's uh, very long. Um, it has, I think, about uh, 1,600,000 rows or so, 1,700,000 rows. <clears throat> and um, one thing I'll, I'll pause here for a moment um, just to let you know is uh, uh, that this is a very large file. Um, you might have trouble opening it in some versions of Excel. Um, I know in the last um, lecture I had some trouble opening this using the LibreOffice tool that's popular on Linux. Um, so what I've actually done is um, installed this uh, numeric uh, spreadsheet, um, which is really nice in that um, it supports extremely large spreadsheet sizes, uh, and also um, it tends to be very fast and responsive. So I've always liked this one for doing um, like large data analysis just because of those two uh, traits. So you can install this. Um, it's available in most Linux packages under this name, uh, just a uh, numeric, right, or numeric. <clears throat> um, I give some instructions on how to install this in Kali. Um, so, for instance, in Windows, it might be it might prove difficult to install a copy of this program in Windows um, if you're having trouble with your version of Excel or LibreOffice in Windows. Um, so, I give some example of how to install it in Kali. Uh, one thing I'll caution you is just that. Um, it can take a long time to open the entire file. Um, so just keep that in mind. <clears throat> so the other thing is that um, don't open the CSV directly. Um, how a lot of the spreadsheet programs will want to work is um, you'll open an empty spreadsheet and then you'll want to import the contents from the spreadsheet, making sure that um, when the system prompts you, which is I've got a screenshot of it right here, when the system prompts you, um, make sure that you change the separator from being one of the normal separator types uh, to being this pipe character, the, uh, the vertical bar that we discussed um, that's located near your backspace or enter key. Um, so I use this to load up the spreadsheet here. Um, so what I might be able to do is I might be able to search for invoice 
.exe within here, and we'll see if this is something that can execute very quickly. Um, if I can't um, run this very quickly in the spreadsheet, um, mainly I just kind of wanted the spreadsheet here to demonstrate, um, you know, what uh, what it's going to look like after you import it successfully. So you can see that it has tabled out all of those different columns um, uh, for me already. So the search probably going to may take a little while. Um, what I'm going to do uh, just to speed things along is I'll actually look for it in. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll actually look for it on the raw disk using. Uh, using um, grep. So, <clears throat> yeah, so what uh, what we have here is um, we have the CSV file here. Um, you can see that it's about 358 megabytes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grep for um, invoice uh, invoice.exe in this spreadsheet, and I'm going to send it to less so that, oh, missed my shift. So if you give it a capital F there, um, what that'll do is that'll interpret um, this as a uh, just a plain string instead of some sort of pattern, um, which will often make the searching a lot faster if you are just looking for a literal string. <coughs> so now, um, this is the cool thing about the uh, about the spreadsheet program is that um, uh, or that it will help you with, although we'll just look at um, the contents right here. So um, the way that this file is laid out is it gives you the, um, each one of these rows is actually the timestamp of, um, of the file that we're looking for. And you can see the spreadsheet completed the match as well, and it showed me a bunch of places where that's located, including one uh, cell right here. So I can actually step through these. You know, um, if I bring this up, I can actually step through each of them to try to see, you know, what's going on, right? And so I can actually see that here, um, invoice.exe is actually installed to a number of different locations. Um, this one is the you know, this is the raw data of that spreadsheet, um, or I should say of the, of the CSV, um, that's also showing me the same thing. So it says that there's a uh, Windows invoice.exe, um, there's a Windows system32 invoice.exe, <clears throat> and I can see that there's an entry for um, the file creation, file modification, um, the MFT entry, uh, file last access, so you can see the uh, uh, MACB uh, entries are all listed here. <coughs> so you can also see the timestamps are associated with them all as well. So you can, uh, according to this system, it says that um, the um, events all happened around this time, right? So what I can do is I can actually um, sort these, um, and it'll show me in you know uh, in order of operations, not necessarily in order of occurrence on the disk, when all these things happened. And so now what you see with this is you can see that the last modified time of the Windows System 32 invoice was actually set to this 2019 um, February date, uh, which is likely the um, timestamp that was in, that was, uh, you know, that was pulled in from the file when it was first installed on the system. So the last access time is 4.12, so this is when um, the file was run or read on the, um, on the file system. Um, it lists the creation time as being, or the create date, and create timestamp as being the same. So you can see right here, um, these don't necessarily happen out of order. Um, they just all happened within the same minute, so the spreadsheet, or within the same second, so the spreadsheet um, uh, put them all here. But then you can also see that um, shortly after that, about, say, um, 
a few minutes or maybe about 20 minutes later or so, 22 minutes later, um, another file shows up here. So that's this whole um, block here. Another file shows up of the same name in Windows System 32, so Windows System 32 invoice. Um, <coughs> And then finally, um, you can see that uh, there's some more entries that are added here as well um, shortly after that. Um, and then, um, so the metadata was updated. And then finally, um, you know, a couple of other entries as well show up here. Um, so this kind of gives us an idea that, say, sometime around like 4.12.22. Um, and again, this might be, um, I'm not sure what time zone this is in, but. Um, 4.12.22 is when uh, some sort of activity started happening that was related to a file by this name. And that continued on um, for, you know, at least like a half hour or so after that. Um, if not more, there's some more activity that happened here. So what I might want to do is go back to my spreadsheet here and say like, um, you know, times accessed. So 04 say 12, right? So we'll do that. Um, 04, we'll say 34, 19. So I'll put 22 right here, <clears throat> etc. right? So we've got all that stuff set up. Um, so I'm going to close this over here. Um, we've got all that stuff set up, so um, what I'll do next, what I would do next would be, um, say, I'd be interested if invoice.exe shows up uh, in any one of the other um, data, uh, data sets here. So we'll go back to the lecture notes, and um, <clears throat> we'll start with this auto runs thing, right? So the auto runs uh, tells us um, say what programs were installed for persistence on the system. Uh, so if we know this invoice.exe is possibly like reconnecting um, every time that the user reboots the system and everything, there has to be a uh, connection in Windows or a uh, configuration item in Windows that's causing it to do so, that's telling Windows that this program needs to start up. Um, so what we might want to do <coughs> is go and look at <clears throat> the auto runs, which is this file here. So we'll look at it right here. I'm going to open it up. And I'll look for invoice.exe. So you can see that it's right here. So it says at <clears throat> um, 6.24 a.m. So, and again, I don't know what timestamp that is, but sometime around 6.24 a.m., um, C colon Windows invoice.exe was put into this registry key. So again, if you've read um, the documentation on the Windows registry, right? So um, go back out to the course notes for a second. Um, this is a good... Um, a good moment to pause and just remind you, we have a bunch of documentation here on how the registry is organized and specifically what these um, five different registry hives mean. Um, so you can see that they're referenced, uh, whoops, you can see they're referenced here. Um, so there is one that's set up as a system, what's called a system run key. So what I might do is I might um, make sure that I add this here. And make sure that we get the path correct, right? C colon Windows invoice.exe. So not the copy that we saw that was installed in System32, but the copy that was um, installed here. And then I'll just do 6.24 a.m. on 1.28, um, just to kind of keep keep my notes um, in a timeline here. Um, let's see if uh, there's any more examples of this. So it looks like that's only showing up here once. <clears throat> so then the other thing, 
um, that uh, you'll remember is that we pulled uh, memory information and we ran it through volatility, right? So we did this whole thing. Um, and then I have all of the example data is here. So I, again, have unzipped this into a mem dump right here. So all of these are the same files that I've provided to you. Um, what I might want to do is look for invoice.txt in each one of these files. So now you can see that there's a lot of them, right? So let's start with that timeliner file, because that one was uh, uh, was really helpful. So I'll do, um, <clears throat> I'm going to sort the timeliner, uh, because um, if I sort it, it'll ensure that the, um, uh, the data is going to be displayed to me in the order that it occurred. Um, time based, not in the order, not in the position that it exists in memory, which may have nothing to do with uh, time. So what I might do is I'll look for all of the cases of invoice.exe showing up in here. And um, an important thing to keep in mind is that um, I'm actually going to go and stretch this out a little bit. Important thing to keep in mind is that um, some of these events don't have a timestamp, and if they don't have a timestamp, you'll end up with something that looks like this, the 1970 January 1st timestamp. So um, that doesn't mean that it recorded at that, at that time. That just means that that's a uh, blank uh, timestamp um, for data that, doesn't, that isn't timestamped. So you'll see that um, managed to extract the invoice.exe process and some process data about it. Um, did it again down here, too. Um, you can compare the process ID here to the process ID here and the parent process ID to the parent process ID um, to identify that in both of these places it's actually talking about the same process. Um, so it managed to pull like uh, process information for the same process from two different places. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually using the slash um, invoice .exe. So if you're in less, um, this is kind of how you go forward and backward. Um, but if you're looking at this in Excel or some other spreadsheet like that, um, you can use the you know the move forward and backward commands that are available in the UI. So um, and so I'll keep skipping. So what it's showing me now is the ones that were kind of at the uh, the bottom of the view for me earlier. Um, so I'm going to skip past those. Um, and so you can see that there's some more of this uh, data as well. <coughs> so um, this might be easier um, if I was to uh, filter by the timestamp at the beginning of this, right? Uh, so that's what I'm going to do, because there's a bunch of information here that um, doesn't seem to be uh, very helpful. Um, to me right now, other than telling me that there is a process running that's invoice.exe, and we already knew that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to look for anything that happened um, anytime on uh, January 28th of 2020. So if you remember, when we go back here, this is why I'm marking down what I'm seeing go on. So um, And let me go add that, uh, add that up here too, right? So... 20201028 right um, cuz that was the timestamp that was on um, uh, that was on them uh, that was on um, all of the events that we saw uh, so what this will do is um, I'm going to pipe it to last so this is going to um, filter all the timestamps down um, to just show me the activity that happened on that day <clears throat> so now I'm going to look for invoice.exe again and so what I can see here is that um, it might have messed with um, some of this stuff, um, some of the network settings, some of the session manager settings. Um, these are all like machine configuration variables. So again, um, you know, we can you know, look up what each one of them do on the internet. <clears throat> but um, what you can see here is that um, uh, C Windows invoice.exe got uh, populated in the what's called the shim cache. Um, so the shim cache is uh, basically a place where Windows will populate uh, Windows will populate some uh, optimization information about a program when it runs. So if that information isn't already in there, it'll create um, or populate data inside of there that'll help it if you want to run the program again. Um, 
So since it's something that's typically triggered when a program runs on Windows and it's not easy to avoid, um, oftentimes we use that as an indication of when the program was executed under Windows. So um, you can see this timestamp seems to be when invoice.exe uh, was uh, executed, so 4.12.22. So if you remember, that's the timestamp we have here. So aha, we have a nice um, bit of connecting info that's not just at the file name level, but is also uh, at the timestamp level as well. So you can also see that we have some more down here. Um, so it has um, <coughs> it has uh, it's present um, here as well in the um, in the user's uh, startup folder, um, and then also um, over here, and you can see that each one of these things um, occurred. This one, um, 04.27.04, and then this one, uh, this execution occurred at uh, 5.22.21. So what we may do is we may pull uh, this thing out. And so this will be another type of persistence. Time stamp did that have? So that had uh, four twenty seven oh four. Great. And this is the opened time. So um, you know when the program was executed, when the program was opened. Um, so then here's another one where five twenty two twenty one. Um, did it again, but this time from the system32 folder. So we'll put this in here as well. So 05, 22, 21, 128, opened. So you can see that it was uh, attempting to be run uh, multiple times, so I was trying to get this, I was trying to get it to execute, and I couldn't get it to execute on the first try, and that's actually very common with the adversary, and this is where some of this um, some of this data comes in really handy. Um, oftentimes, um, the adversary themselves will have trouble uh, running, uh, say, a backdoor on a system that they're not very familiar with, and they themselves aren't really the admin for, so they're not familiar with all of the software on the system that might conflict. So you're likely to run into cases where you find a lot of different breadcrumbs like this about it. So... <coughs> So what you'll see is I'm uh, skipping some of these because they um, uh, they go and describe uh, say the process uh, interacting with um, you know basically trying to open up one of the registry keys um, or registry hives, um, but the fact that it did it is the only thing that this row um, and I'm talking about the two up here that are highlighted actually tells me it doesn't really tell me why or what it was doing or anything like that. Um, what I'm doing is I'm kind of skipping through this file looking for significant information. So in this case, um, invoice.exe required a number of libraries to be loaded. Um, so this might give you some insight when you're doing forensic analysis about what type of um, capability the malware has. Um, so the, um, you know, the malware is oftentimes going to use capabilities that are built into the operating system. And it will only open up um, you know, certain DLLs if it's actually going to use um, the capabilities in there. So, um, in addition, you can see that, um, yeah, so here's the, you know, process creation, and then the thread creation from the process, um, and then again, here's some more uh, DLLs that were loaded. <clears throat> so, you know, here you can see some of the cryptography stuff is lo uh, loaded, um, you know, and a number of other um, features as well, um, so it kind of gives us some insight. Um, I'm going to go through a number of these. Because what libraries, you know, every single Windows program opens a large number of libraries. Um, this tells you which source, uh, which data source it's actually getting the information from as well. So, oh, whoops. Yeah, so what we will do is I'll skip over a lot of them. Yeah. And so that's everything that was in the timeline. So then, let me go back here and look through, um, and I'm going to 
remove the timeliner now from the you know from the output here, and let's see what else you know if there is anything else in here um, that might be useful. So you can see there's this um, VAD info that has um, you know uh, that indicates that it was written into the Windows folder on the on the hard drive at some point. Um, you can see all three of the um, locations are installed in the shim cache here, so I may save this. Um, right? So I may save that as well. You can see the um, process lists are here, including um, I suppose the timestamps are related to the process, maybe the timestamp of, of process indication. Um, the sessions as well, so the window sessions that were open uh, during it. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, there's all these things. Um, so then the other thing that's neat is uh, under the command line. Um, so command line picked up the copy of it as well. So I might want to go and look in the command line. Whoops. And so invoice.exe, um, it's showing me what command line was specified. You know, so when invoice.exe was run, was it run with any arguments, that type of thing. So you can see like the, the Cuckoo agent that I have installed on the system or on this VM uh, that's being loaded by Python is right here. So, um, you know, this can oftentimes be informative as to um, when malware is running on a system, um, does it need arguments in order to run, that type of thing. So, you know, so um, basically, we got um, a large number of examples of where we find, you know, where we found invoice.exe located. We noticed that it was written in multiple different locations, so it was written here, um, and then it got written here. So it looks like it got written here, and then an hour later, it got written into System 32. Um, and then an hour later than that, it got written into this registry key. Um, I didn't exactly get a, uh, a time for the, uh, you know, for the invoice. I might actually have that down here somewhere. Um, one thing I can do is I can um, go into the MFT file. Oops. And I can grab for 2020-01-28. Um, so I'm going to use the exact same technique that I used on the previous one for trying to narrow it down to just the stuff that matters for this particular day of activity. And then I can pipe this to sort so I can get it to sort it all for me. And then I can look for invoice.exe to this. And this tells me that, you know, 4.12.22 is when all of these, um, you know, file writes occurred and everything like that. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and you can see when, like, the last accesses were, which is around uh, 4.30. Um, and then we can see that uh, later on at, um, say, 1.25, according to the timestamps on the system, um, it was also interacted with in the C Windows folder. So one of the um, one of the interesting things that you might have picked up here is that I um, was able to find that it also existed at some point in this folder. However, this is not present in the um, in the MFT output that I'm showing you right now on this screen. So I actually can't find an occurrence of that file in here. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, when I compromised my system and I got the back door installed into um, both C Windows and C colon Windows System 32, um, so when I got invoice.exe installed in those two places, um, after that, I actually deleted the file from the startup folder because it was able to start up in a much more, um, you know, much more obscured location. So... Um, in the startup folder in the start menu, 
Um, that's a place where the user might accidentally be navigating the start menu and come upon it and then find out that you've compromised their machine. So after I got that initial foothold on the machine, I then tried to move the um, malware to a location and then remove the old location. Um, that caused the um, file to get deleted from disk, but because I did all this forensics where I also collected memory from the system, you can see that some of that data was still latent in memory. Um, and so I was able to actually gather that information from, uh, uh, from my analysis. So those are the types of steps that, uh, you know, you'll want to, um, you know, you'll want to think about. Um, and I would recommend um, trying to run through the data that I've provided. So all of these data files are actually provided right here, um, or excuse me, right here. Uh, so at each one of these steps, I actually have each one of these data files available um, for you um, that are based on what my uh, compromise was. And then on Thursday's class, what you'll end up doing is you'll run through a similar set of steps and you'll be analyzing um, the malware that you built and uh, compromised the host with uh, last week. So, um, said uh, thank you and uh, you know, have, a, have a nice rest of the week.